Okay. Hey everyone, we are checking that it works. If it works. Um, you can write us in the chat message in case you don't see or don't hear us. I think that thing is going to disturb us. Okay, I'll close it. Yeah, close it. <laughs> <sighs> can someone write us in the chat that you are here and alive? Oh, maybe. You, you want live comments, not top comments. I can see you. Greetings from India. Yay! Okay. Yay, we have people, it works. Oh my God. Thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs> Greetings to India. Yay, people we don't know. <laughs> Amazing. Ciao. Ciao. <laughs> you have some support group from Italy. <laughs> Lucky you. Any Russians to support me? Ничего. Ничего. Никого. 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 Because you should use yeah, I should use the part you're right, you're right, you're right. I, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I am supposed to know these things. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yay, greetings to Mexico. Okay. Hold on. Okay. No, yeah, it's too early. We just... Yeah, we, we were checking. I mean, the yeah. camera on my computer sometimes works and sometimes doesn't, so we should check. <laughs> Yay, UK. Hi, guys. Hello. Dennis has been on an online conference in the UK the whole week, so basically yeah. you're like, <laughs> <laughs> I am. I have been living in UK time. It was not really on UK time, so it was more like mid Atlantic time the conference. <laughs> but, um, but yeah. Oh, salut from France. Oh, salut de la France. Très bien. Okay. By the way, when you speak loud, silent, it's hard to hear. Yeah, I should speak louder. You're right. Yeah, and then I can make fun of your French accent. So that's good. What do you prepare? Do do you have? I don't know what to say. <laughs> tu veux dire que je ne parle pas trop bien français? C'est pas, c'est ça la question? <laughs> like, people say lol, this means that your French accent is funny. It's probably funny. And I'm not French, as you can probably tell. Yeah, greetings back to Netherlands. Hmm. Okay, it's six. I think we should wait for a couple of minutes for yeah. more people to come and then we'll start. How many people do we have? I don't know. Oh, 40, 42 people? Yeah, that's already more than an average math talk we give, right? Oh, that's, oh, <laughs> hi, mom. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, how do I? I mean, it's her name. Yeah, I got it, thank you. <laughs> um, can, I don't know how to make the screen. I think we should be able to do it. Hi, from, to, back to Pakistan. Mm. We haven't. So we'll, we'll start in three minutes, I promise. Yeah. Just waiting for more people to go. Oh, it says here. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. As you can see, we've never done a live stream in our no. lives. I mean, the, the grand total of my YouTube experience actually is like the video of my lectures. So. Uh. Oh, maybe before we start. Oh, oh hi, hi, Peter. Peter. <laughs> Thanks for coming. That's awesome. Okay, so before we start the live stream, I can use the opportunity to advertise your lectures. Oh. So last semester, <laughs> oh yeah, last semester, Dennis was giving online lectures on stable homotopy theory and putting them on his YouTube channel, which is not as popular yet as mine. <laughs> <laughs> I know I cannot compete. <laughs> oh, привет, Daniel. Рада тебя видеть. That's my. Uh, uh, a guy from my high school in St. Petersburg. Oh, wow. Yeah. And hi to US. Okay, I'm already excited. We don't have to do the whole <laughs> <laughs> No, 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 no. The people that are here for... <laughs> I mean, we got already all the 
satisfaction from the <laughs> positive reinforcement. Uh, link to the stable homotopy lectures. Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> oh, oh, now, okay, now you're going to steal my audience. No, just kidding. No, I mean, I'm not putting new videos because the, the course has stopped. But, um, one second. I'll do it. PhD live suggestions. Well, uh, hmm. hi, Boston. Uh, PhD live suggestions. Wow. Hmm. You should not forget to have a life outside of your PhD. That's an important yes, suggestion. That's... Very important. Someone has an experience of not doing enough of that. <laughs> Did you send the link? Yes. Oh, cool. I think it takes a while for the between when you send the thing. No, you didn't. Did you send? I did. I think it takes a while. Oh, OK. Um, OK, so if, in case you don't in case you don't get the link, just Google Dennis Nardin. Yeah. Um, Okay. Um, and you'll get his webpage where there are lectures. And um, how much do we get paid? I think I get paid twice as much as you because I work in I think. I think so. I don't know. We should compare. But. Oh. Yeah, if there is a new pandemic next year, you'll be listening to me teaching algebraic geometry in case it's online, but I hope it's not. <laughs> I think someone needs to approve, perhaps, since it's a link. I'm oh yeah, sorry. So um, in in the YouTube rules, you you are not allowed to send links to the to the chat. That's not us. That's YouTube. So that's why your message will never get sent. Um, I think. Oh. Uh, yeah, there is nothing I can do. I checked the settings, and that's oh. what YouTube does, and it also does to the comments for the video. Okay, that, just Google in my web page on the University of Regensburg, and uh, and you should find it. Okay. Uh, so we'll start in two minutes, we promise. That's the last two minutes of it. Oh, but. Yay, thank you. You're very welcome. They're also fun and motivating for, for us. I think it's time. OK. OK. You're right. It's like in the theater when people are, you know, getting angry when they <laughs> and the, when the conductor arrives. Yeah. The director. So the okay. conductor, the conductor uh, oh, look! It's the first comment. Okay. So, um, okay. So let's be serious. So, welcome to MATLAB Balance. It's our first <laughs> live stream here, and I'm very happy to introduce my uh, co-author and friend Dennis Nardin, who is a postdoc at Regensburg University where I used to work also as a postdoc. And uh, today, I hope to use Dennis' experience at doing math. And uh, we will try to get some practical tips about uh, doing math research for people who are beginning to do it. But uh, OK, we called it, I called it Q&A, how to do math research. I hope it's clear that it's a joke. There is no, you, no rules are actually uh, possible in this uh, thing, but we'll try to maybe give some tips. And I think the main thing to say before all we say is like you learn everything by experience by doing like giving talks and writing papers many times and then uh, you, you just learn it so basically for people who have more experience it would I guess not be interesting to watch because they have already figured out the ways for themselves but uh, I hope um, it could still be some help for people who are just started. so do you have any general comments or we can get to um. questions uh, I don't know if I have something to add to what you just said. It's just, uh, yeah, I mean, and also, yeah, I want to say, I mean, what I'm going to say is not going to be necessarily the truth. I mean, it's not, I, I'm not in process of the secret of how to do research yeah. uh, <laughs> and the, the magic that will guarantee you a great career or whatever. Uh, yeah, we are not magicians. We uh, just like tr spend some time trying ourselves. I, I am happy to share what I looked and what works for me but yeah and uh, so i yeah i took uh, some questions from the uh, youtube comments but you can write more questions in the chat and i will see them and note them and they will appear but let's start um so the first uh, question which was asked in different forms by marcos and andreas um where and how do you learn the main ideas of a subject or a proof so where and how so first of all, where? Where is hard? I mean, when I have to learn something new, usually either I already have some references because it's 
something that I learned because I, I, I met it when I was learning something else, when I was trying to do something else, and then I got some references, or I just put literally the name of the thing on Google, and uh, uh, and that's it. And I look what it is. The first results sometimes are useful, sometimes are less useful. So you, there is a lot of trial and error about how to find good resources. Um, Usually, there are a couple of places now that I have more experience that I know are, are good for finding resources. For example, if there is a survey in the handbook of K-theory or the handbook of homotopy theory, it's usually something that's worth checking out, at least, uh, for me. Uh, but this is something that's related to my research. And sometimes I literally just go randomly. I find a random matter of flow post with a link to an obscure paper, and I open it up, and oh, Wow, that's uh, that, that's useful and interesting. Or you hear, or you, you can also ask people you know actually what's the good resource for learning X, and they will tell you. So that's how to find uh, resources. Uh, uh, how to actually learn? Maybe, maybe I could comment on where. So you already mentioned service. I think that's what I always do. I'm not sure if it's uh, a legit thing, but uh, I check on. I try to find the most modern survey articles and maybe if things are explained in lectures for students, so like informal texts rather than old, old uh, papers, um, if it's possible. Um, so, um, yeah, um, I know the, the right thing is maybe to like, read the classical text, but secretly I would, if something is on Stex Project, which is an online source for algebraic geometry, I would use it rather than go to big books with like lots of facts where it's hard to find things. Yeah, we know your relationship with EGA, don't worry. No, that's a secret <laughs> and that's a live stream, so please don't tell about it. <laughs> I think you mentioned it in one of your interviews, actually. No, <laughs> not yet. Um, and you were saying like how, how to learn ideas? Yeah, so once you have a bunch of resources, uh, a mistake that many people do at the beginning of their career, a mistake that certainly I did, was to try to read them in order. That doesn't work. Uh, you probably heard it before by other people, but what you should do is you should read it. You should first try to figure out what are the statements of the main results. So if you have a paper, try to read the introduction, and usually that's where they say what, at least in the opinion of the, of the author, are the main results. And you should try to understand the statements and at least a big idea what the definitions are. From there, it, sometimes that's enough, actually. There's been situations where, you know, I was just wanting to, to learn the statement of a paper and then I, I just read it. And one thing I said, so that's it. I didn't care about the rest of the paper. But you suppose you want to learn more, more details, because you want a deeper understanding or whatever. You, I, I usually go backwards. I usually try to figure out what is the main step that you need to get to that paper and try to learn and understand the name of the, of the, the, the sorry, not the name, the statement of, the, of this step, or the main two steps, I don't know. Maybe, you know, you do two cases, you start to understand really well what the two cases consist of and what they're different, and etc. And then you go backwards, and at some point you stop, either because you run out of paper or because you run out of interesting things. Um, so uh, that's... Uh, that, that's how to read papers, I guess. Uh, that was part of the question, read papers or books. Uh, so basically what you're saying is you try to focus on the main statements and then uh, understand more details in the proofs. And I guess main definitions are also important. Yeah, main definitions, sure. Uh, uh, yeah, and then uh, so maybe you, uh, you you learn proofs. Like you don't try to learn the full proof, understand no. the full proof unless you really need it. So uh, in like... So someone asked if it's a function of experience. Well, it's a function of experience to understand what you really, how much you really want to know. And which are the main <laughs> steps. That's also important. Yeah. Sometimes, the, when, sometimes what is the main step is buried in the proof because, yeah. <laughs> uh, because people have different writing styles. Let's put it this way. <laughs> um, and it, it takes some practice to suss out from, from the text what is the, the step that you want to really understand. Um, and what is like the technical detail that, yeah, okay, you need to do, but it's, it's not that important. So, okay, that's how to read paper. I don't know if you want to add something to this. Um, is it your full answer? I have more. No, to I say. mean, I have, I have, I wanted to say also how to more generally how to learn a subject rather than a particular result. But, uh, okay, let me say more about reading papers. So, um, myself, okay, please don't, no one should take me. 
as a role model for doing that, please. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, you should. <laughs> but uh, myself, I need the main thing I need for reading a paper is motivation to read that paper. And I usually get that motivation um, from uh, hearing, so it's like from talking to people and from hearing someone being excited about results in that paper. That is really the best thing that helps me to be motivated to understand it, to like, to get to know the paper. So then uh, if someone spoke about it excitedly, I would read the introduction and then I would maybe start reading a paper, get stuck immediately uh, or in five minutes. That, that is normal. Yeah. Just and then uh, I would go like talk to people again. Why should I care about? So like to get unstuck, I again need motivation. So I usually again ask questions to people who know about this stuff. And then they tell me like, oh, you should care about the proof of this result because of this and that. Then I would try to read the proof maybe if I'm, if I got it, if the people were enough excited. Uh, and then like, this is this, you know, paper, people, paper, people. So for me, it's always a balance. I don't just read, I don't sit down and read a full paper in one day. Like that's uh, too isolating experience for me. Um, and uh, yeah, so I guess an, a super important thing that I tried also to emphasize in the interviews is that asking a lot of questions is fine. I mean, I ask a lot of math questions every day and no one has ever complained about it to me at least maybe secretly no, people no. complain <laughs> but to me no one has ever told them what are you asking too many questions Th that, um, that never happens that someone asks too many questions so so yeah asking about other people's intuition often helps to often helps like someone okay someone is asking here how yeah. do you um yeah so how to how to find the key steps. Well, I mean, my method is to ask people who, say people who wrote the paper, for example, you can ask questions. Um, if, if you have concrete questions, you can write an email to the authors and they would also explain something. So asking is good. Um, and another thing, so someone, there was a question in the chat, like what my, that someone's problem is like to reading same math again and again. Well, if, it's a, if you feel that it's a problem, uh, I don't, I can't discuss a concrete case, but I remember a quote from my math friend, which I really liked. He once told me that mathematicians are not like predators who eat a piece of meat, but rather like cows who chew the grass, same grass, like over and over for hours and days. <laughs> because, um, you know, you, you read a piece and then like you don't understand it well, and then you hear something that helps you get, get back to the same piece, read it. So it's really, helpful, important, and normal to be rereading same things later with like more experience and maybe you, you get to see more things and new insights. So yeah, we are like cows, that's yeah. yeah. I, mean, <laughs> I absolutely agree with, with this metaphor. Also, I want to say, I noticed in the chat, someone asked me how useful it is to pose and try to redo things on your own. And that's definitely super useful. Uh, try to redo a proof or a key step, try to retell it to yourself. And in fact, something that I, I do uh, often is I when I when I want to learn a subject. It actually, in fact, it happened just last week. I wanted to learn some prismatic cohomology for, uh, for for a project I'm working on. It's not very important. It's just something that I wasn't I didn't know very well or barely at all. It's a very recent result, and I wanted to learn a couple of things. And I wrote a tech file on my computer trying to explain what I understood. And that's very helpful for me. Not so much because uh, I'm going to do anything with that tech file but to, to fixate the ideas that, that were new and are floating in my mind and try to give them form, give them in the form of an, in the shape of, sorry, of an explanation, especially, is very helpful. Try to write down what, for me, are the key points, what, for me, are the key definitions, and try to make a story out of it. That's a lot easier to, to keep it in your, in your head. <laughs> Yeah, I was I was actually so uh, I was planning to discuss it later, but yeah. So um, that's my r recent insight of last year, which has been super helpful. In that, as a student, I used to like write a piece of material in a sense. You know, you read something, you write the main statements, you try to write the proof. But like I was doing it more like copy pasting. And since last year, I I stopped doing that. I just have a file called understood where I write only things that I sort of barely somehow understood and like in words, which I can understand in plain words, just like uh, being very honest. And this has been more helpful for me than, than copying the like, precise statements. So maybe, I'm not sure if it's a correct way to do it, but it has been helpful. I think it's, 
very useful thing. Okay. So to be honest, I'm failing at like talking to you guys and reading the. <laughs> I am trying to pay attention to the. <laughs> and reading the questions. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> I, I I told Dennis before the live stream that uh, it won't be more than 15 minutes until we get a, get a question whether we are dating. Um, I have an answer to that. I was planning to say that being co-authors is cooler because you get a close connection, you get to talk every day, you get to ask each other lots of questions and discuss lots of things and, and you can still date other people. So that's cool. Um, okay, so um, how can I, oh, there are so many good questions. People, you, you write amazing questions. I have no idea. I, I, I can give you a, um, a hint that I've seen in other live streams. Uh, when you have a question for us, perhaps you should tag us. Like No, the, no, I no? see they, they all write good questions, but... Um, it's just to make them stand out from the hello or whatever. No, they're mostly questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, I don't know how to... Let's see. This will be recorded, I think. That's an easy question. Yes. <laughs> Uh, okay, give us a minute of reading. So, um, okay, how much do you write down? I think that's a very, that's depends, on the, depends on the person and the text and how much you need to know. So sometimes you're looking for, sometimes you actually need to understand the proof in full detail because you're trying to generalize it for your PhD project. Then you have to like write down everything in full detail. Sometimes you're just looking through a paper because someone mentioned it and you thought that person sounds cool. So that's, you, then you don't need to write anything down. So, you know, it's very dependent. Um, okay, we do not answer actual math questions in this live stream. I think if you want to read about K-theory, yeah, go read the handbook of K-theory. No, no, not the handbook of K-theory. No. I mean, that it's like a 2,000 pages paper of surveys. Okay, uh, don't. <laughs> I mean, it's very good, I like it, but perhaps not as, not, not as a starting point. I, I have a nice survey of Mitchell that I like. But, uh, okay. Um, oh, that's a good idea. So there's a question whether you write a graph of de dependency graph of lemmas in complex proofs. Yeah, that's a good thing to do if you, if, it's, if you feel like it helps you sometimes. Yeah, sure. Nice, nice question. Um, okay. Um, da, ba, da, ba, da. How much of it do you aim to understand when you read a paper? Well, depending on your optimism levels. <laughs> <laughs> no, but no, no, but let me tell you, you should always open a paper with the idea of getting a general understanding. And then if you discover that the general understanding is not enough, you can go deeper. But you should never start a paper thinking, oh, I'm going to understand every single detail because you, you'll die trying. Uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's not a, a, a good approach to read the papers, uh -huh. at least in my opinion. Yeah. OK, question, How, follow your passion versus or what is popular in math, actually. Um, um, I was talking, so one of the next interviews is with a person who came from physics, and he's saying that he enjoys math more than physics uh, because in math, it's less important to follow the mainstream path. So like he was complaining that in physics, everyone had to do string theory once it became a popular topic. And in math, people do lots of different things. So you are not as uh, obliged to follow the popular subjects, but it's good to try to learn a bit about popular subject, maybe go to a seminar uh, to be aware of what people are I mean, interested it's in. It's also very good not to be super specialized. I mean, you will be on some level, but too much is, is not good for you, neither career-wise nor actually at the math development-wise. Nor psychologically. Nor psychologically, <laughs> yeah, that's true. But okay, psychologically, maybe you have other hobbies, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where do we get inspiration for our research topics? Oh, well, that's, that's a further question. Actually. Okay, yeah. we'll get there. Um, okay, cool. So, um, we don't learn everything before. So, there's a question about algebraic geometry whether we learn everything beforehand. Algebraic geometry is a giant subject, <laughs> it's a crazy thing. People started doing it in like 18th century. Beginning. Yeah, definitely. Yes, and definitely. then they didn't stop. They like they, this was the subject is growing exponentially. There is no way to learn everything, even like even any finite sub um, amount mean, of everything. Let's so, put it this way: I don't do algebraic geometry. We have a I have a narrow specialization. I don't know all about the narrow specialization. I don't even like even ten percent of my narrow specialization. <laughs> so, so we just you know we we, we struggle. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, you you have to you have to learn how to. To, to work while not knowing everything. That's the only possible way. 
Um, wow, 60-70% of the paper, that's a huge amount of, of the paper. Yeah, I usually hope to understand the introduction. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, cool. I think... Um, so if you have more concrete questions that we don't discuss here, you can, for example, write me an email. Maybe I could say something because we clearly won't be able... You have more good questions than we have capacity to answer. So... Um, the change from a student to a researcher. Well, do you feel like a researcher? I'm not sure I already feel I like a researcher. <laughs> it, it's weird because it was very gradual. Um, you, you learn stuff yeah, and then at some point right. you start, you know, at, I think at first it started with, for me at least, rediscovering things that, uh, that were already known. Uh, like I, I, at some, I remember I was a, an early student, I rediscovered the, the the, ex the proof of the existence of the completion of a, of a vector <laughs> space. It's not important. I rediscovered some stuff that was already known. And then you say, OK, it's already known. Oh, cool. Then I understand it well. And then at some point, the stuff that I rediscovered was discovered for the first time. And it was just a slow transition from very, very trivial statements that you can prove very easily. And then you, you feel cool because you found the proof on your own without opening a book. <laughs> I don't know. That's like that's an actual mathematician's answer. My answer is that when I have to file forms for traveling for like visa purposes, you have to put your occupation and you have to choose. And there is like this button researcher. I always freak out because it doesn't feel like being a researcher. <laughs> oh, you are a researcher. You totally but, are. So then, uh, okay. But I promise no psychology in this. So okay. Um, so let's go to the next question I prepared, which was um, a question asked at least by uh, Julian and Marie. Uh, which is what to do when you're stuck on the math problem? An important question. Oh, I should stop, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the first thing is you stop working on that problem. I mean, it depends on how urgent it is, of course, but you can always do a pose and do something else. Um, usually I start working on another problem or I go out for a walk or I do some other stuff that it's doing. And if it's a research problem, so it's not something where it's like super urgent that I get a, uh, a result like right now, like it would be, for example, for a homework, uh, I can leave it two, three days even of doing other stuff before uh, going back to the problem. And that really helps uh, because your brain sometimes just needs time to process the, the thing. Um, sometimes it's helpful to do related things, not your problem, but stuff in the same area. Sometimes it's helpful to give a clean break. There is no universal recipe, but it's, it's always helpful to leave your brain time to to do its stuff. And it happened to me sometimes that I, I woke up at 4 a.m. in the morning with a solution in my head and I s swear that was not intentional and I do not consider it a pleasant experience. But this was when my brain decided it was time to, to let my conscious being know the results. Uh, so uh, uh, sometimes it's weird. I mean, but if you, if you just focus and try, no, I, I'm tired, but I have to solve this problem. I have no ideas, but I have to solve this problem. You're probably not going to solve it. You know, you're, you're, it it's not a good strategy to try to power through. You can do it with very simple problems, but most of the problems you're going to, have, you're going to be stuck on are not going to be these kind of problems. You can just power through them. Um, it's sort of like writers. There's very similar to the suggestion to solve writer's block, actually. Uh, when writers have writer's block, they don't know what to write. If they just sit down in front of a computer and try really, really hard to type, usually at best you get rubbish. Uh, and, and for math is sort of similar. Uh, I think it's worse for math. <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> Is it yeah, yours? Can yeah. I say more? Yeah, sure. okay. of course. So, um, yeah, so I think being stuck, so for me personally, being stuck in a math problem is very painful. So I don't like that experience. and I. Uh, usually, I get to ask. Um, yeah, um, I get to ask uh, colleagues quickly um, about this problem. But uh, I think important things to know are that asking. So many people, I think, have a feeling that asking someone about the math problem is like giving up. I don't think that's true because you learn something when you ask someone, and moreover. Even uh, formulating, like explaining to someone a question very often solves the, it for you. So like I often write, like I, I type a message in WhatsApp to Dennis with a math question. And then by the time I finish like formulating it, I'm like, oh, actually, this question does not make sense. Um, so formulating is good. And uh, the thing I do myself, so like to, to stop, to 
prevent this like immediate asking is I tell myself that I don't have to solve the whole problem. I just have to make one. So like first, okay, formulate. That's an underrated step is like formulating concretely what you don't understand, like pinning down the moment that like that you're stuck at, and uh, not just the general question. And um, I try to uh, to make one step forward, so like to advance a little bit and then maybe go ask, not just immediately ask. Uh, and uh, another thing that uh, that is underrated, <laughs> or at least uh, for me, it's important to to check before before claiming that, oh, I'm stuck, poor, poor me, uh, to check if I'm honest with myself, if I'm really stuck, or I'm like lazy to check the definition. Uh, and like, I was you know, secretly hoping it works out with like formally without knowing the definition. Well, uh, then it's not called being stuck. Or if I'm just like not interested in the problem and that's why I'm not solving it. It's also important to, to ex like admit that you're not working on the problem because you don't want to. That's okay, just like, uh, I think that's, more helpful than saying, oh, I am so stuck. Um, but yeah, like discussing with others is good. And as Dennis said, clearly if you, so uh, so Littlewood writes about it in his um, mis 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 miscellany, miscellany uh, that uh, it's, so someone also asked here about time management. So <laughs> time management, wait, it's related. So it's, I think it's an extremely personal, you should, find what time management works for you. For me, for example, it's very different than what I see around. But an important part, I think, of time management is to like scheduling time when you're not working on a problem or not doing math. So that like after you have tried to think hard, so that your brain has time to process and you will see that it will be like, you know, if you did some math and go to a party, well, after Corona, then in the middle of the party, you're likely to get an answer to the question. Um, yeah, so um, this would be my 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 things to say. Let me check what you guys are writing. Um, and then, and then. Oh, we have someone from high school. Um, okay, math is not useless. You can pursue it as a career. But I, so people, by the way, you're reading the chat. You can also write to each other answers if you have any. Uh, that would be nice. Then we have less questions to answer. <laughs> uh, okay, so. Um, one sec. Uh, so there's a question whether if you understand more than half of a paper, you should spend more time on trying to understand the full paper completely. Well, no, I don't think that any like achieve, ach achievement focus is a, I think, not a helpful thing in research. It's a creative uh, kind of um, occupation. And uh, if you try to like understand everything, just like to have the feeling that, oh, I completed a task. Well, that will not be very helpful, I, I think. Um, so, okay. So time management is very personal. Um, yeah, I, I, I never learned how to do time management. I, I really should learn at some point because I'm terrible at it. Um, I'm really, really rubbish at it. Uh. <laughs> what I learned is that all the normal time management techniques don't work for me and I should with my own life. But okay, let's go to the next important question, uh, which um, also a uh, few people asked, for example, Vignesh in, in the comments, which is uh, how to come up with good math questions. So uh, this is uh, going to sound like a creative writing class. Uh, the, 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 the right way to come up with math questions is read math questions, uh, or read math in general. Uh, or learn math. So uh, math questions don't grow in isolation. Math questions grow when you have a lot of ideas in your head, some new ideas pop out. And yes, I'm counting new questions as ideas. Uh, that's very important. Questions are, are creating new questions is a creative endeavor. So you should read a lot of math. You should go to talks. You should talk to people, especially. And when you do this, when you, you go to places and you, you, you get exposed to math, at some point, you will notice some similarities or some between stuff that you've heard before and stuff you've heard now and say, oh, but maybe we could do in this context X something similar to what was done in context Y. And this doesn't need to be like a precise, oh, I can copy the proof verbatim. So that's always nice when it happens. Uh, but <laughs> it doesn't necessarily uh, have to be <laughs> like that. It must just be a vague analogy or whatever. Oh, this looks like it should behave this way. Can I prove that it behaves this way? Um, 
also you should like write simple examples. So I have uh, I have this object that I'm interested in. Let's see what happens when I do it for polynomial rings, for example. Uh, let's see what happens when I do for fields, and see what happens. Oh, what's happened for fields? This very neat thing happens. I wonder if something similar happens in general. So you can try to to play and to see what what could happen in general. Of course, the exact same thing is probably not going to happen, but you can try to work by analogy. So it's a very messy and creative process. Uh, but uh, yeah, but concretely, I cannot give you a recipe how to come up with a math question. This doesn't exist. But you should think a lot of math, and then math questions will appear. And that's actually something very important that I didn't believe when I was a student. Someone told me, oh, you will ha at some point you will have more questions than you have time to work on. I say, no, that's impossible. It's too hard to come up with good questions. Well, <laughs> guess what? That happened. Uh, you, you don't believe it. I didn't believe it at the time. But you accumulate so many ideas in your head throughout the years that at some point, questions just start to pop out. And I have a long list. And actually, every time I have a question in my head, I write it down. I have on my, on my office a piece of paper with a written list of crazy questions. When I, I write, the, they don't need to be particularly sensible question, as you can guess from the <laughs> title of the paper. But when a question appears, I write it down, just not to, to forget it. And uh, and I haven't had time to work on any of them yet, but um, I will. I think the list is growing so fast because answers are much more seldom in math than questions. <laughs> That's also true. <laughs> but you shouldn't underestimate good questions. Good questions are important. Yeah, so maybe I'd like to say, okay, we, you discuss good questions and you assume it's obvious what a good question is. Whereas sure. I think that's also something to discuss. So as far as I understand, what is considered a good question is a question which is neither trivial nor unsolvable um, or like unapproachable. So there is, if you imagine like this is the humanities collective understanding of math and then maybe there is like but it's not well defined so like things which are close to it but not extremely far are sort of good questions but um did you answer can i see more yeah, I so i think uh, uh so an important thing is that you cannot just sit and wait until a good question comes to you uh this certainly requires practice and asking lots of not so good questions like they don't uh, yeah, if you'll be silent, they will not like <laughs> become good on, on their own. And uh, also with, I think even with most uh, experts, um, with the biggest experts, it's not like they ask only good questions. They ask lots yeah. of questions and then some of them are good in this like metric, but many of them are within humanities understanding and many are out of reach. So we're getting into the Taurus. Uh, is Anulus. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> is is an well it happens by accidents i would say and another so i would distinguish questions that are when you're like trying to understand something uh like just ask about like oh i don't understand this concrete thing or you can ask like day daydreaming questions like what if this happens um and um and yeah, so both questions are important. It's not that like trying to understand something is a bad thing or like both uh, these are different questions, but both important. And I think it's important to ask any kind of questions because people, so why, why is this such a big part of doing math? It's because asking to people is different from Googling. While Googling is an important skill in doing math. So it is like, if you have a question, what is, the definition of A, it's good to Google A before you go to ask people. But usually when you ask people, they don't just read the wiki page for you. They uh, share their intuition. And for example, in that article that I made a video about in Thurston's article, he writes about how people share much more intuition and insights in like uh, in um, Oh, what? Uh, in uh, person no. <laughs> in, in the chat than uh, in, on paper. So usually you, you get, even if you ask like the simplest questions to people, they usually share some more intuition. So you, you get to know, to learn more than, than you expect. It's like you go to a shop, you know, to buy carrots and they also give you chocolates for free. That's like my usual experience with math questions. And then sometimes they don't give you carrots. I thought, I thought you were about to say with the grocers. 
uh, and I was about to ask you which grocers you recommend. <laughs> Never mind. But um, and and that, okay. But I have s several more important things to say about questions. First, please only ask questions that you actually want to know answers to. This is important because some people, and that can be annoying questions, may ask questions just to show off. And this is something that people feel and don't appreciate as much. So, like on a conference, someone may ask, like, "Well, you see, you can feel it," and that is not a pleasant feeling. Or on the conference, people may ask, like, what are you doing? And then you can see that they're checking their, like, their watch when the lunch time is finally coming and you stop talking about what you're doing. Uh, so that's not cool. Please ask when you actually want to know. And this is also, it's pl pleasant for people to answer them. And uh, another super important thing, the most important thing is like, after you ask a question, you have to try to understand the answer. So active listening is a super important skill in math. It's not somehow discussed enough, but active listening is like one of the main skills, I think. Yeah. So which means that you try like try your best to focus on what the person is saying, try to ask more questions, try to like catch the main ideas if you cannot fully follow. Like with my PhD advisor, I can hardly follow 5% of what he's saying usually. And this was my whole experience during whole PhD, maybe 10% sometimes, but I would like, Try to you know you like take some things as black boxes. Try to re ask him again, like whether these were the main points, uh, whether this is a summary of what he said. Um, so not just like stand there and listen and like wait until it's over. That's not helpful. <laughs> yeah. And actually, if I can add something to this one, I, I know many people, especially younger people, but even people with a fair amount of experience, that are afraid of asking stupid questions while doing this conversation. Don't. Uh, I mean, really, ask everyone ask stupid questions. Uh, that's fine. And in fact, that's one of the best ways of learning. Of course, they should be questions you have at least thought a tiny bit about. But once you have expended just a small amount of thought. Like 15 seconds. Yeah, I was thinking five, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you should just check that you're not just saying word salad. That's what I'm, I'm saying. Uh, but once you have done that, just ask it. I mean, yeah, maybe if you work on it for two hours, you can find the answer on your own, but maybe not. And it's, it's not really a good way of having a conversation. Um, you, should, you should feel free to ask questions. Yeah, and people are much, so when people like are explaining something to you and you ask more questions during it, people get feedback. It's like, it's like playing tennis, you know, you need to get back the ball. Otherwise it feels like playing to like just sending it and you don't know where it is. So, uh, people appreciate getting more questions while they explain because then they get to see your background, they get to see what to explain better. So it is helpful for them also. And people usually think, oh, I'll just look stupid if I ask more, but this is helpful for the person who is explaining you something. They don't, over and also while you're trying to explain some math, you don't have headspace left to think of whether the person is smart or stupid, like your brain is actually <laughs> is busy. But also, it's not really, I mean, when, at least when I explain now, I, really, that I, I care more about is the person, does the person understand or not, rather than is the person intelligent or stupid, because... Or, or if you can think whether you are intelligent or stupid, because you're trying to... Yeah, that, that's, also like, that's also a waste of mental processing power. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think people stopped asking questions, maybe they gave up on this. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh, well. Um, okay. So, uh, oh God. Look, people. There, there are many questions about ter Terry Tower. Look, I've got many requests about interviewees, and they all are about Fields medalists. I think that's unfair, and uh, I don't plan to do just Fields medalist interviews. Um, so, not sure. I'm not planning to ter interview Terry in any time soon, until, unless he contacts me. I don't know him, I don't know anyone, so I have no contacts with him. Um, he works in number theory, by the way. And he says, I watched his interview, he said that he, the two things, That's two areas, it. two areas that he's the most uncomfortable with are algebra and topology. So, I yeah, think... I, I, mean, <laughs> I, I think he works in analytic number theory, okay. specifically. Okay, yeah. So As very, very an analysis kind very of. Very far from what we do, yeah. so yeah, that's not so cool. Um, oh, that's a good one. How can one explain difficult notions in simple words? I wish more people asked that question. That's hard and that's very important. It's also, I think, a super important skill. And you notice that people who have more experience, who write like this complicated giant papers, they somehow tend to be able to explain better 
it in simple words. Um, can can I say something? But I don't know how to. Yeah, can you like? I don't know how. I think you you need to try so to do this. And I think it's this question actually is is wrong in some sense. You you ask how can I explain things in simple words, but that's not what you want, and that's not what you should do. Uh, the focus on simple words, I think, is is usually makes a lot of explanations difficult to follow. You want the explanation to be easy to follow without the background, but you shouldn't be afraid of using complicated words if you explain them clearly. I think sometimes people try to explain things too simply, uh, like, I don't know, there was this professor that I want to name that spent the whole first year in linear algebra class talking about tables of numbers instead of matrices because it was simpler and he didn't want to introduce the, word, the scary word matrix. And I think that was a terrible idea. Um, I hope he doesn't watch this video. Uh, I don't think he does. Uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, but, but someone might know who this person is. Uh, but anyway, that's the point. You shouldn't like hang up so much on simple words. Sometimes introducing a complicated words can simplify the explanation and make it more accessible. You should really try to give an explanation with the minimum amount of new concepts, not with the most simplest possible words. You should try to introduce one, two concepts per explanation, not more. And that, that is... Uh, oh, that's a good idea, yeah, actually. And, and if you need to use complicated words for that, just use them. That's not important. That that's the not in a certain measure, of course. Uh, but, uh, yeah, actually. So maybe that's a, that's a cool advice. So like, try to remember that the human brain has like a finite capacity on understanding new concepts per minute, and try to bound that. Yeah. But uh, actually, so I partly disagree. I think it's a cool skill to explain difficult notions in simple words. I have no idea how to get it. Uh, my master's student told me I have that skill. So. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm yeah. sure you have. Actually, <laughs> you explain very well. So, um, so maybe we can comment then. How how did the dynamic of our collaboration change? I mean, we still didn't kill each other, and we've been working yeah. for two years. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we need to know. <laughs> there were ups yeah. and downs. No, there were no downs. Really. Mm. Really but like in pandemic, so we just, I mean, we resume and ch yeah, I, I want to talk about it later. But I think the dynamic, I mean, you just like, well, the cool thing about collaborations, which I found is that even when you spend a lot of time with people with whom we work on a common project, you're less intended to kill them than like with, you know, family members. Like even spending a lot of time and talking a lot somehow does not make you irritated um, because you have this common goal, which is cool. But um, how to balance time between reading and work and your research. I think you should trust to your brain. It will like, after you read too much, it, or like, okay, also trust to your advisor. Yeah. But first advisor and then your own brain, because like myself now, it, as a postdoc, I just feel that if I just read randomly to, at some point I feel tired of it and I want to do something concrete. And then, Again, like if we work on a problem and we feel stuck, I'm like going home disappointed and then opening a random paper in the evening just to get a flash of some new math and <laughs> pretend that I learned something today. <laughs> um, uh, okay, we won't talk. I think job market is not a good, I, I would not discuss job market in this live stream because it's depressing and not helpful for young people. Young. <laughs> job market in academia depressing. is tough. That's all that needs to be said. Yeah. We can we can cry about it in the interviews. <laughs> oh, um, I don't know. Oh God. Oh, speaking of leaving research, the next interview is going to be with the, with your PhD brother who who has quit academia. So he did PhD and then did postdocs and then didn't get a job. In a place um, he sorry, so, so, since we, we are talking to more junior people, when she says PhD brother, and she means someone that did the PhD with the same advisor, not my literal brother. Uh, OK. And so <laughs> he, I made an interview with him about the experience of living in academia. I think it's very interesting and helpful. And you'll learn a lot there, I hope. Um, I don't know how important. Like This question was already posted before, Yeah, OK, so maybe. <laughs> Actually, I do think that different areas of math require different types of thinking, maybe, but it's hard to explain. Yeah, he does still think about math. You just watch it. I will not tell you the teasers, but he is super fun. 
And cool, and yeah, he does still think about it. He is super fun. I haven't seen the interview, but he is super fun. <laughs> um, I had another question prepared. So, um, oh, this is an important yeah, question. Yeah. So, um, and it's, it was a question from R in the interview comments. So, hi, R, you're also here. Cool. Yeah, yeah, so, yes, yes, please do look to salt into me. Anyway, um, so the question was, how to keep, how do you keep track and organize all the math you learn? So um, I have, as I said, when I learn something, when I want to learn something, I usually write down um, a small tech file with what I, what I care about. And I have a folder full of random tech file of stuff. And then I guess the answer to how do you organize is I don't. Uh, but uh, hold on, I have, uh, th there is method in this madness, even if it is definitely madness. Uh, <laughs> um, so I have this very disorganized folder of T PDFs that are usually, I'm usually kind of careful in how I name them uh, so that they're, you know, okay, what should I need to find them like five years from now? Uh, and I also have handwritten notes in my tablet nowadays, and so I still have some old scans of stuff that I literally handwritten with a, paper, with a pencil and paper. And, and I, it's a bit chaotic, but I mean, I make sure that if I, if I look for it, I can find it reasonably quickly in say 30 seconds to one minute of, of looking. Uh, and, and I think that's the point. I mean, you shouldn't try to build this complete, well-organized library because learning stuff is usually a chaotic process. Um, you should make sure that you can go back and find it when you need it. But you shouldn't like waste a ton of time in trying to, to organize it very, very carefully. Um, because that's not, that's not a productive use of time, in my opinion. Um, of course, it can be overwhelming at first. Um, that's why I'm writing tech files. And sometimes the tech files get very, very long or very, very messy. Uh, but it did happen in the past that. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry. Oh, going. wow. <laughs> Someone has been Google stalking us. Um, yeah, so actually, I think, I think there is some magic in your organizing because. I'm very bad at finding references, so I usually ask Dennis, and then he sends me a reference within 30 seconds. Usually. Oh, the, the, the point is the name I give to the files. I make, well, I, I really put thought in that. <laughs> I really put thought of, okay, what is the name, what is the first thing I would look for when I when I have this topic? And I think it's magic for the first. <laughs> um, uh, is, is that your answer? Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's my answer. So I don't organize. I have this... Uh, this magic naming, founding. <laughs> also, okay, maybe that's not something to share in live stream, but Dennis has a cool technology with coming up with passwords, which he always tries to force on. Oh, it's diceware for people. I mean, I didn't come up with it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's where your skill comes from. But um, yeah, that's interesting. I still, I still have no idea how you do it, but okay, that's something to try. For myself, I used to write down like notebooks, like you know, students write, like just I had a notebook where I would write what I learned. And then it was my whole PhD. And I now I I wish I would type it instead of writing. So as a postdoc, I started typing. Um, but like again, I'm still not as advanced as Dennis to use tech files. Mm -hmm. So I just write in words because it's faster and easier for me. Uh, and um, so I, I, I have three files, it's all organized. <laughs> <laughs> we have completely different systems. <laughs> I have like probably more than 10,000 files. <laughs> uh, I, it, it took me almost 10 years to accumulate that. No, almost 14 years to accumulate that. So. <laughs> I have three files. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, there is stuff that I wrote like in my second years of undergrad or whatever. And, uh, I don't think I've looked at it in like 10 years. Okay, it's I used to that. have notebooks, so they're just not there. I scan them. I scan them. I have every single note that I have it somewhere in my, in my computer. Oh my god! Okay, you have a dedicated person here and a person with three files. So three files are one things I understood. Second things I am too lazy to dream about, but like creative questions. And third, um, third is my daily 
journal for like what I have done in math today, which is helping me to, which is like helping me with the psychology of doing math and the math life balance that was asked about. So this helps me to build realistic expectations of what I can do because I used to, before I started doing it this year, I used to, you know, go to bed every evening hoping that tomorrow I'll wake up with like super productive motor who does so much math. <laughs> and then somehow every evening it was like, not today. Um, <laughs> And a disappointment would come. So now I write down, like, like in this journal, I write all the math I did today, which is like just little things, but like several of them. And then it also helps to see that research consists of like many in non meaningless things that somehow sometimes sum up to something eventually. Yeah. And that's um, has been helpful. And um, and oh, so to people who lost their undergrad notes, um, yeah, uh, is um, what I found really helpful is that okay, I didn't scan notes at, like Dennis because that requires more dedication than I have. And it requires just a scanner with auto feed, honestly. Uh, but okay, but I, they're in the notebook, they're like, okay, never mind. So, uh Oh, I, do, I have made notebooks like with, with rings, you know, the one you can just put out and just feed. Yeah, okay, them. smart boy, what can I say? <laughs> okay, <laughs> what I wanted to say is that even if you lost your notes, even if you don't have your notebooks, whatever. So I think what is really cool is that you often remember that you have learned in the past some topic. Um, and this really helps me. So I don't know, when I see Lee algebras now, all I know about Lee algebras is that when I was a student, I read a book on the algebra, and I remember no single statement from it, except that it was easy to read. And so this like experience of having already learned something in the past, even if you don't remember the details, uh, makes you to think um, like, oh, this was easy, or like not easy, but you know, you have overcome this difficulty in the past. So uh, if you need like to, something about the algebra, you will be able to understand it again because second time it's, it's simpler always, I think. Yeah. So this, like, so basically, even if you lost all your, I don't remember the name of the book. Come on, I told you, I don't remember anything about the book. Mm -hmm. I just, nowadays, when I see the algebras, I think, oh, these are my old friends. And like, I'm comfortable with this notion. So maybe, uh, and so don't worry about losing your notes or something. It will be like, you will be psychologically more comfortable with the things you have learned already in the past and it will be easier. So it is not a waste of time to write things even if you don't scan your notes like some extremely pedantic, dedicated mathematicians. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is the right moment for do you hate other mathematicians? <laughs> So. I mean, why why would you waste your time hating someone? I mean, seriously, there's math to be done. I mean, okay, if someone has seriously hurt you, like extremely offended, that maybe you can hate them. But this is, this would not be have much to do with their mathematician's work. It's like some people are bad people, but I think there are very few of them among mathematicians. You're actually quite safe. Well, quite safe, uh, more or less. Sometimes less, but mostly. So yeah. Um, let me look through the questions. Okie dokie, okie dokie. Oh, an important one question which everyone should have a precise answer to, and the answer is yes. How useful and important is it to try and learn different areas of math that seem far from your own? Yes, like expanding is extremely important, and uh, maybe it's your advisor's job to. To, to have some control of how much you expand. So maybe don't spend all your time learning all the math in the world without doing any work on a concrete problem. But in general, having a broad mathematical education is super important. Like expanding your vision, going to conferences, going to seminars, learning about things that aren't your subject is super important. Um, and yeah, this helps to like talk to people, helps to, I mean, that's what doing research is about. It's, it certainly consists of learning about things outside of your vision. And I remember, so, uh, well, maybe some people often ask, like, if they're not in this chat, but in general, people often ask if they're, like, good enough to do math or something. So I usually we try not to judge others, but I remember once that I thought that, like, my, a person in my office was probably not going to become a mathematician because she came back from a meeting with the advisor and said, oh, can you imagine? 
he told me I should read this like Invenciones paper, which is a, like a top journal. And uh, what if I read it and the answer is not there, then I've like wasted my time. And I was like, well, <laughs> okay, that's not a good attitude. If you think that- uh, Especially since the answer is like in not, usually it's not in the first like 20 places you look for. So I mean- But yeah. like she was, she was upset that she might have to read this hard paper because yeah. it's in a top journal and that it may be a waste of time. So yeah, please don't consider reading things outside your like PhD problem, a waste of time. There is no such thing as waste of time yeah, when you do research. I mean, it's all a waste of time. I mean, <laughs> if, if one thing you can say, I mean, if you want to stay in academia, uh, you will have to do something different from your PhD thesis problem at some point. Uh, so you do want to, to branch out. And of course it's possible to overdo it, to, to spend too much time on learning too many things or not, but I don't think most people err in that direction. I think most people, are too focused rather than too, too Yeah, broad. especially PhD time is... Hi, Jeremy. Uh, oh, there's Jeremy. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Jeremy. <laughs> okay, sorry, we have some friends here. But um, uh, there is a thing in the PhD time, it's very tempting to think that like your goal is to finish your PhD project. So I've seen many people focusing on their PhD project while I was like looking around, chatting to people, and luckily my advisor did, has never complained about it. And I thought this was, this felt good. And uh, I think I was very lucky that uh, Mark is never just like never. I think a good advisor. I mean, okay, it is possible that an advisor tells you, okay, fine, it's good that you it's yeah. good that you learn all these things, but you should also write something at some point. Yeah. But in general, I don't think that advisors are opposed to. Yeah, so I think it's what what Richard uh, Thomas said in his interview that he tries like his advising is like he tries to watch whether a student is like reading too much and then he tries to like make tell them to focus on the problem or if the student is focused he's trying to like force them to to read more different things so it's it's good to keep a balance you learn to keep that balance with experience but please don't just focus that is like unhealthy and and then it may feel like a waste of time and also maybe a thing to know so someone is writing like don't kill my tenure job dream no we are not killing anyone tenure job dream but one dream i want to kill so um when you're working on a phd it's very tempting to think that like once you finish your phd you'll be like so proud of your thesis you'll think it's like such a great thing you did in three or four years of your life and you will like show it to your aunties and like be proud of it till the rest of your life. well the truth is most people at the end of their thesis think that their thesis is nothing meaningful and uh, and they don't. So after you like make a paper out of your thesis, most people don't want to see their thesis ever again. And they. I, I don't know anyone who doesn't hate their thesis at the moment of the defense <laughs> because you work so hard on it. You're like. Ugh. And in the end, like in the end, you understand the, like your thesis, and then you think it's trivial, and then <laughs> it's so maybe don't put. So if if, if during PhD time you were like fully focused on on your thesis, and at the end you feel this like usual disappointment by the final results of your thesis well you'll feel quite disappointed about your PhD time so it's better if you like do you know learn a lot of math and, and go to many conferences talk to many people and in the meantime somehow write a thesis and then even if in the end it's a disappointment well it was not the main thing <laughs> I mean you have other things going on right <laughs> yeah <laughs> um um we don't use software besides taking I don't know. I mean, I use a PDF viewer to read the paper. So <laughs> it and I guess there are various chat systems I'm subjected to these days. But, uh... Okay. Um, oh, okay. There is a question that we will address right now. Um, um, I could not consider being a physicist because I don't understand physics at all. And I tried my high school to understand how electricity works and I failed. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, yeah, maybe I mean, you should explain it at some point. Huh? I should at some point if you want. But many people try it. Yeah, okay, well, I can try. But okay, now I also wouldn't. I mean, a physicist is a very dignified thing, and etc. But I wouldn't consider it a, a mathematician. They're different. They, even the way they write is different. Yeah, the intuitions are different, and they. Very different. Yeah. Um, oh, we will t we will talk about collaborators. Um, how to switch? Oh, come on. so I mean, a general question about switching. Okay, I think there is a question how to switch from higher categorical. No, from let's, classic. Let's like, okay, we have people in the chat who are working in like higher categorical algebraic geometry. Can they answer this question? <laughs> I don't know. 
<laughs> Should we name them in person? <laughs> maybe, they, maybe they left already, but there were people who were like suited for answering this question. Should you do like during class point, you answer this question? Yeah, like, Peter, are you still with us? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Um, and collaborators is later, I think. Um, oh, yeah, that's that, that's a good comment that someone says, okay, Joshua says, that he feels comfort, not comfortable not understanding something. Yes, Peter. Oh, there is Peter. Peter, so there is a question. Can you answer it in the chat about switching from higher categorical to regular? No, from, from algebra. regular algebra geometry to higher categorical. Okay, Peter will figure it out. Efficiently. There is a word efficiently in a question about math research. These people are just <laughs> no, making no, fun of us. Well, one, one thing I should efficient. say, it, I'm going to assume that most people here are junior, are more junior people, and tell you, you won't believe it, you'll be faster learning stuff later. Uh, seriously. Uh, at some point, I had to learn a whole new area of math because I, I started working it, and I literally learned the basics in an afternoon. I, I was shocked. It would have taken me like six months, like, three years earlier, and then it took just an afternoon, and it was like, wow. Which um, area? Quadratic forms. Oh, <laughs> come on! An area that... like an undergrad. <laughs> no. Yeah, just kidding. No, I, I, I mean, a little bit more advanced than undergrad <laughs> level math. Okay. Hermitian key theories, if you have to say it out loud. Yeah, OK. But uh, oh, I see. Uh, yeah, so, OK, if you just read a book linearly, you'll never finish learning. Well, no, that's what we said, right? Yeah, linear. So somehow learning math research is not a learning math is not a linear process. That's like. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if Peter appreciates that, <laughs> us giving him this responsibility. OK, never mind. Didn't you cross? Um, yeah, OK, so uh, maybe. So there were already questions about collaborators. And to get there, let me um, pose the next question, which was originally by Gurav, which is, um, how does writing in collaboration work? Oh, boy. <laughs> Dennis has four papers, which are by nine authors. So good luck. So yeah, that, that, that was. Um, OK. Um, so there are two things. There are, there's the practical side of writing in collaborations. And that is the more, uh, how can I put it, human resources side of the collaboration. Um, so from the practical side, you should use some way of sharing files. It used to be Dropbox. I highly recommend Git if you can convince your collaborators. Um, that, might require, <laughs> that might require some passive aggressive uh, technique, but, <laughs> but it's worth it. Uh, Anyway, you should have some way of seamlessly sharing files with each other. Uh, and uh, so, and from a practical setting, you should have regular meeting. I usually have weekly meeting from a paper I'm actively working on. Um, even if you don't have much to say to each other, it helps, you know, keeping the, the paper in your head so you, you work on it. And you usually chop it up and assign. So, okay, there, there are. Two steps, right? There is a step in which you find the results, and there is a step you write up the results. Finding the result is a chaotic process. You usually have this meeting, you chat, you try to you know, do stuff. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but you, you, it, working in collaboration is essentially chatting, in, in, in my experience, uh, and trying to do math chatting. It's not that different from chatting at a conference or chatting during the tea break or whatever. Uh, only hopefully some math will appear out of it. And in fact, sometimes a collaboration happens, outgrows from chat, chatting at the tea time or at the conference. Can I interrupt you that I was at a conference where Dustin Clausen was with his wife, who is not a mathematician, and she told me when I was having lunch next to her that I heard mathematics is a solitary profession, but all Dustin do is chat. <laughs> <laughs> and you see how many papers he writes? I mean. <laughs> That's true. And OK, so that's that's the, the creative part. And then there is the writing part. And usually what happens is you chop the, the, the what's supposed to be written in pieces. You assign each person something to write. Uh, but the very important thing is that even if each section or each part is written by a single person, everyone should read and edit everything, even for really long papers. Uh, uh, yes, I, I read the whole 400 pages of, of that thing. I did. 
and I edited at least more than 200. So, you know, uh, took me a while. Uh, uh, but it, it's very important because, first of all, because you, you, you get mistakes and everything, but it also, uh, you also find the presentation, like the, the different people have different ideas about what's the best presentation. And it usually helps to confront each other about it and say, oh, I think you should put more emphasis on this, or I think you should split out this stuff in a separate corollary or a separate lemma or whatever. And, and it, that really helps when everyone is, maybe it's not the, the presentation the way they would have written it, but it's an amalgam of how the preferences of all the co-authors, and it usually ends up in something more readable than you know someone's idiosyncratic ideas of, oh yeah, sure, I should absolutely do this half a page statement of a theorem because that's the best way of reading, uh, of reading it, which also happened in a paper I read. Um, and there is also the, the psychological part of you know how to uh, set up disagreements. So usually people are pretty friendly. In a few situations, we had to organize a voting system uh, to, <laughs> to make decisions about notation and stuff. Uh, it worked out pretty well. It worked out better than the anarchic discussion we were using before. Uh, <laughs> um, um, but you, that, that's something you will have. It depends on the personalities involved and how many people are there. Yeah, so my answer my, short answer to an answer how to write paper in collaborations would be slowly. So oh. usually the more collaborators there are, the slower the paper is written, which is counterintuitive because there are more people working on it. But somehow everyone expects that the other one will do their part and you know. But it's also more fun and usually you get to, ultimately you have more math results in the paper. So I would, I highly recommend collaborations. I don't like doing math on my own. Uh, but okay, a, more, a little more practical um, advice to what Dennis said is, okay, we, we just, I mean, how we discuss in like person, email, Zoom, and all the messengers. But um, I think we start a tech file when there is like there are enough promising ideas that it could potentially become a project. Maybe some some of their our like joint tech files don't become math papers, but okay, we started them. And then um, so we, we use GitLab so that everyone could edit the file and we could see the parts they edited and the comments. And, and especially the difference between the different versions. Yes. <laughs> That's very important. <laughs> uh, and um, and the, the, uh, the, the feature that Dennis introduced to our collaboration is, <laughs> oh, that's the best part of our job. <laughs> that's my main contribution. Yeah, yeah main contribution. <laughs> okay, not the main contribution. Is that um, in, in the tech file, which is joint, that we have on the side, we have comments by people which are uh, separate color for each person, which is nice that Dennis introduced this feature given that Dennis is colorblind. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> but uh, that's really uh, convenient. Um, and, um, oh, so given that it's super slow to write a paper with collaborators because like, you know, everyone thinks that others do stuff and then you think, oh, maybe we could improve this and that. So how we finish a paper, to be honest, uh, when someone has a grant application or no, grand deadline or job application or this kind of thing, we speed up and then we finish a paper. So usually like papers get finished towards the fall because in the fall many people have to apply. Just to be clear, why do you think she's here now? Why do you think we are meeting together now? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you a secret, it's not for the, the live stream as nice as this is. <laughs> yeah, I have to apply for jobs in the fall. So I thought it would be nice to try finishing a paper. <laughs> um. Yeah, so um, I think that's what I had to say. Oh, and we argue a lot about, mainly about the title and the introduction. Is there the... No, the introduction is under, oh, we'll uh, we should, we will get there, you're right. Yeah, so let me, that's what I had to say. Let me look through the questions. So, um, okay, Peter wrote some answers, that's good. Uh, okay, my apologies to girls. Uh, we are awesome, that's nice. Oh, so self-taught mathematicians. I think the problem with self-teaching math is that after undergraduate level, I think it, it's extremely important to talk to other mathematicians. So if you can isolate yourself in such a way that you can talk to many mathematicians, at least online, that's great. But learning on but, your own, I think. But there is also one thing that there are like practical skills in writing papers uh, or giving mm -hmm. talks that we will talk about that mm -hmm. are basically impossible to get on your own. 
So you really need someone to teach you how to. No one taught me. Yeah. I mean, no, no one taught me either. But you know, they they drop you in. I mean, well, usually yeah. what happens is people criticize you rather than teach you. <laughs> <laughs> but still, you know, you have to take what you can. But it's, yeah. It's, so I think the atmosphere, the environment, is extremely important. And um, oh, th there is a super good question. Like whether you should try to attend conferences as a PhD student, or is that just for professors? No, no go, go to conference. Go to yeah. as many conferences as you can. Yeah, that was one of my biggest regrets as a PhD student. I didn't go to enough conferences. Yeah. So also, professors often have families and lots of teaching duties and responsibilities, and they don't cannot go to as many conferences. PhD time is the best time to go to conferences. You get to know people. You get to do networking. You get to learn a lot of different math. You get to have fun and get friends, and that's cool and important. Um, of course, it often happens that you learn something from a seminar and then you use it in your research. Yeah, sure. That's like what uh, also I also say that some of the things you learn from a conference are maybe not things that are given in talks, are just given that things that happen in the in the coffee hour conversation or whatever. I mean, it's yeah. learning is. Yeah, so random. about disabilities, unfortunately, I think we both don't know because we are shamefully oh, yeah. able-bodied. Uh, and I also haven't heard about, like, unfortunately, it's not yet discussed enough. I've only seen a workshop for caregivers, which was nice. No, like, nice. organized, there was last year organized, like, a, in US, a well, session where... Like Tina, right? And five more people, okay. where uh, caregivers were given an opportunity to uh, to spend time working on their stuff and being not distracted. But otherwise, I don't know. I think if you're applying to a specific place, you should write to them and ask them how exactly will they uh, um, help you in, in your situation, or not you, but like whoever needs, should, should contact explicit universities because it will be different at every place. Um, Okay, uh, how to find the best supervisor for yourself? That's a good question. I think you should look for your, like, among people with your research interest, you should apply to different places, but also it's important before you actually sign up an agreement to become someone's student. Oh, okay, it's different in US and Europe, but basically it's important to talk to a person who will be your supervisor before they become your supervisor. And then, and then you will feel if the conversation is going well, they must be, inspiring for you and you must be excited after meeting your PhD advisor. If after if after meeting a professor you feel intimidated and scared and never willing to open mouth again, this may be not even if it's a famous professor, this may be not a good match for an advisor. If you leave the meeting being like excited and inspired and willing to learn more math, that's a good sign. Uh, go for it. Yeah, I, I don't know how it works in Europe actually because I didn't my PhD in the US. But in the US you usually have an, an open house I don't know how it works now with the COVID, but you have an open house before you have to decide which offer to accept. The various universities that accepted you organize a visit where you have to, when you can chat with the faculty. Yeah, in Europe it's not like that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but talking, talking, even like from one conversation, you'll get a feeling and that's good. But among, okay, among, okay, that's important, but also try to, if possible, when possible, get a more, so like, more well, famous advisor. Mm -hmm. famous, famous, famous is the wrong word. But let's say that when, if you plan to do an academic career, when you apply for jobs, your letters of recommendations will be important. If your advisor is unknown to everyone, uh, this may be less helpful. So, like, yeah, but you shouldn't. I also but, say they shouldn't just go with big names. Uh, yeah, and, so it's, it's, it's a balance, balancing act. Yeah. You also want someone that you can work with. Yeah, so that's that's important. And of course, every wonderful mathematician has a first PhD student. So you know. yeah, I, I also let me, uh, for example, it was the second, well, second and third. I don't know me and Jay were at the same time uh, mm -hmm. uh, students of, of my advisor. So uh, that can work out. But um, but yeah, the point is that if you after meeting your advisor, you don't feel you could be their friends, then that's not. Or oh, I. Often have like a daughter, father. Uh, okay, friends like, in a in a loose sense, I guess. But. Well, yeah, like enjoy time. If you would like, so I think, yeah. Usually, with your advisor, you also want to discuss not now, but not always. Not but. always, but you should feel comfortable with them. Yeah, that's the point. Not intimate, so not too intimate. So this is a person that you will spend a lot of time with. That sometimes you will have maybe not private discussions, but you know, discussions about maybe you feel discouraged and you don't want to 
have feel that you have to hide from them yeah. when you feel discouraged. And well, most people do, but most people do, but it's not healthy. It's not healthy, and it's not a healthy relationship. Well, uh, there is a question. I'm I'm not answering that. That is the it's question. It's impossible to How answer. How much time a week do I spend doing math? This is like not I, not only don't I know, but I do not want to count because I think. Um, the brain, it's like, it's not mechanical work, right? It's about the effort that your brain is spending. And it may, you may spend half an hour of intense thinking, will be more effort than four hours of like sitting through talks you don't really follow. So time is not a good, I think it's not a good measure at all for doing math. And it, I, I realized it very late. So speaking of time management, it took me many years to realize that time is just bad measurement for research. And it's better to, for me, what I do is like, I try to do some math every day. Like Ina said in the first interview that like she tries to do one hour of math a day and more if she can, if she has like resources and, and energy and time. And for me, that's what works. Um, 40 hours, people are kidding. <laughs> that's so much. <laughs> what? 40 hours, first of all, 40 hours also involves teaching. So please well, have some pity on your brain cells. Uh, no, like 40 hours, I don't. I certainly don't ever do eight hours of math a day. That would kill I, me. I, I don't think it's possible. I mean, you, you can sit at your desk eight hours a day yeah. if you feel like it. And but... like and stare in the screen and feel miserable. No, like I try to do some math every day. It's usually, well, maybe I shouldn't say it in a public video, but usually it's not more than four hours. <laughs> But also, who, also who, like, who cares like, about the amount of hours? Yeah, right? but also I just spend time like chatting with my collaborators on WhatsApp or Telegram, and I don't, I have no idea how much time it is. And we chat about life, and we chat about math, and it's like eventually it's, there are new ideas for projects, but also there is a lot of time, and we joke about nonsense. <laughs> no, I am always serious and. Uh, okay. Okay, cool. Though someone also is like sporadic and impulsive, that's very natural. And you should follow, like, it's, I think, for math, for, okay, regardless of not for time management, it's extremely important to understand how your brain works, how your body functions, what is important for you, and ignore the things that do not apply but, to you. I mean, also, I, I already told you that uh, I told the people that a couple of months ago I woke up at 4 a.m. in the morning yeah, with an idea. How, how, does, how does that count in your time management? <laughs> <laughs> How do you measure that? You cannot measure that. I mean, Dennis is very proud of the thing he discovered at 4 I am proud of the thing. I'm not happy that it happened at 4 a.m. Honestly, that was <laughs> I, I slept really badly that night. <laughs> but, okay, cool. Um, so, um, yeah. So maybe, okay, well, last thing to say for people who, if you are like me and you feel that general time management rules don't apply to you, this is fine. So most people say like, oh, you should not be working on weekends. You should have days off. For me, this does not apply. Like I know I used to try to do like weekends. This I, this feels bad for me when I do like a whole day without math feels bad for my brain. It's like chewing gum instead of eating proper food. Maybe because I don't have an interesting enough thoughts to think them the whole day, I don't know. But then also the whole day of math feels super exhausting for me. It's like too much. So I try to do a little math every day. Uh, we, so for people who are living, we will actually be finishing this thing soon, but not yet. So I think in, we, we can chat 15, 20 more minutes. Yeah. So don't you worry, we will keep you up all evening. Um, yeah, so, okay. So the second to last question that I have prepared from your question. Oh no, there are one questions from each of us that we want to answer that you didn't. I think uh, we, well, did, you, did okay. you skip uh, question five? No. No, no, oh, uh, no. yeah. You... Wait, I did skip it. You did, we asked asking question six and you didn't ask question Maybe five. Maybe I forgot something. Okay. Okay, 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 you're right. I, I know because you're it right. already reappeared. Okay, in, you're in right. This. So actually, while we chat about collaborators are fun, but uh, what are, um, really? So what are the tips on writing a math paper? So I can, I don't know if I have tips. I can tell how I write math papers. Uh, don't know if it's a good strategy or a bad strategy. That's what I use. So I usually write math papers in a very similar way to how I read them. So I first write down the main statement. Um, try to be precise or trying to be precise, the main definition and the main statement. And then I try to fill it back from there. So I, I decide, okay, I have this paper, I have this main statement in this section, 
And okay, let me sketch a proof. I write a proof sketch that's not going to survive to the final version of the paper, not even the version I commit to Git or whatever. It's just for me, very rough, very good, so that I can understand what's the missing step in the proof. What are the, the pieces of the proof that I have to, to write down? And then I write the precise statement of those steps. And I iterate this until I get precise statements and very, very sketchy proofs. And then I start rewriting the proofs. Usually, I start with the one that I know how to rewrite. <laughs> uh, and, and then I work forward to the, the proofs that are harder to rewrite that really require some thought. And this is a process that usually takes a few, a few days, even for a couple of pages or, or one page. I love this comment, sorry. <laughs> uh, wait. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It's true? Yeah. Oh, wow. um, yeah, so that's that's a good plan. So basically, you write a skeleton. So, so yeah, this is, this is a non-trivial thing that math texts are often written and read from the end, not from beginning. And also, part of it is like we write introduction of the paper in the very end. This oh, is yeah, like I the forgot last to mention. I, I was, I was, not the I, first one. <laughs> it was actually written in capital letters here, and I forgot to say it. Introduction, last. Uh. Yeah, so I guess people in newspapers don't realize this. We write them from the end, and we write a skeleton often, and then try to fill in the, the inner thing. Uh, do you have more to say? Or, or no, I think more? I have. So, yeah, I would say, so, OK, I think this is the main idea, but um, it's also Many people have writing block, writer's block. As in, it's, I mean, writing is, I think, painful because um, as someone asked how to do it, well, that's a skill to, you should be somehow at the same time precise and concise. Are these the right words? Yeah, yeah. they are. They so, don't rhyme, so congratulations. Yes, I was <laughs> not sure. So, and this is hard to achieve. So, you precise because it's like math. And you, while learning and explaining, you can be very imprecise and talking and stuff. But when you write math text, unfortunately, you have to be precise. But also, journals will not publish your papers if they are like you write out all the detail, full details of everything. And, and no one is ever going to be able to read whatever you wrote. Yeah, but also, no one's going to publish it. So, uh, this like finding a balance is hard. That's why writing is hard. So, often it's hard to start writing something. And um, for me, what helps is like to write. Okay, today I will not be able to write a, an actual text. I'll write a plan of what I want to see in the paper, and then tomorrow maybe I will write like a plan of like sub subsections, and then it becomes like section subsections, and then like means the and then then so then filling in the little things becomes easier than to start writing from scratch. Um, uh, oh, that's a good one. I I've seen it, but I couldn't quite. Well. I'll explain later. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, if if you are afraid to start writing something, like try to write like the main things that you want to see, uh, the main maybe sections and stuff, and then fill in slowly what you can and leave out what you cannot, and then maybe ask people to help you with what you cannot. So like maybe don't waste time on sitting and staring at the section you don't know how to write. Like write what you can, and don't be afraid to rewrite things if you came up with something with a better way. That's OK. That's not a waste of time. That's also an important part of the process. And especially with the introduction, which we write last, uh, it's totally, so introduction, I think, is the most important part of the paper, because this is what most people will read. Uh, that may be a disappointment, but yeah, that's true. Uh, and so uh, it's totally fine. Um, uh, it's totally fine to. Um, Try to write an introduction and then later realize that, oh, you, you see a better way how to write, tell things. And like, so writing introductions like telling a story. And so if you, in a in few days, you realize you see a better way, it's totally okay to rewrite it completely. Don't blame yourself that it's a waste of time. No, if it's going to be make it better, this is totally worth it. I heard from like one of my collaborators said he rewrites an introduction five times. Maybe that's an exaggeration, but that's totally, mm, so. that's totally okay. Introduction is super important. You tell a story. You try to explain your motivation there. Um, that's cool. Um, and oh, I had a couple more concrete things to say. So what makes it also hard and important is that you must provide precise references in the paper. You cannot just like say blah, blah, and cite a book. 
I mean, okay, some people do it, people. and they are famous mathematicians. Some, some people even write, it is well known, and put no reference, and you're like, I want to kill you. <laughs> Why are you doing this to okay. me? Okay, so some, in some papers you will see such things. Please do not do them yeah. yourselves. Please give precise references, which means you must cite a concrete statement in concrete paper or concrete book or a page in that book if it's not a statement there. Um, yeah, uh, so that is, that is extra work that's hard. It's painful and annoying. Luckily, Dennis is great at finding references, so uh, less easier for us. But um, this is important. And my main request, if there is one thing I can ask in this video to people who plan to write math texts, the main request I have for mathematicians is please do not use references which are like, you know, braces 79 or like, 126, because when you read the text, you don't know what is this to, to, to be completely fair, this is often the journal's decision. People do this on archive. So yeah. you, it's much easier to read a paper if people write, like, use the other uh, bibliography mode where the paper would be like MVW06, which would be like the first letters of the surnames and the year when Maybe you know that by heart. Yes. <laughs> Give me a while to figure out which book you were referring to. <laughs> yeah, that's a book. Uh, so you, then it's much easier to read the paper because usually you know like the main sources in your subject, so then you know what people are referring to instead of 79 and 95 and other unhelpful. So that's my main request for writing. <laughs> Most people still use this. Thing. Because it's a default in fact. Yes, that's the, the, the annoying one is the default, and the other one is like, well, we use alpha. Alpha BST, I think. Yeah. I don't know. Okay, doesn't matter. Just, um, yeah, any paper. Well, we use. We use I, I don't want to shame anyone uh, publicly here. Yeah. Mm. Um, uh, no, nothing counts as a plagiarism. Plagiarism is the use of ideas, not of structure. Of a proof, yeah. Um, so. Reuse of ideas without attribution. It's fine to reuse ideas if you attribute them. Yeah. So, oh, actually, that's also important. Why it's important to give references because this is the polite thing. It's like cr crediting um, rights on YouTube. It's also important. So if you just so students, beginners, I think in math have this attitude of like thinking that it's okay to just write. Oh, this is known and this is known. Well, some people put effort into proving those theorems, so you better cite them. That's the polite thing to say. Um, about, okay, so actually, I think we have very little problem, rather little problems with plagiarism in math. Um, there, there is some, but not much. Yeah. yeah. Somehow, because people, before they write papers, they usually give talks about what they figured out. So, but it's okay to give talks about work in progress. And then it sometimes happens that two different people or groups of people come up with the same stuff. Or three groups of people, hypothetically, and then, and then they write it like unite together and write paper with nine authors, like this happened here. But um, yeah, usually, sometimes people either write it together or quote each other. Um, so we don't have much troubles with poetry. I mean, sometimes, but it's and like, I mean, again, if you have a proof in paper X and you reuse it in paper Y to prove a different, a different but similar statement, it's not plagiarism. Yeah, and um. And um, my dream country is Iceland because of the nature. I don't know if it's the best country to be a professor, <laughs> so to be fair, with all due respect to Iceland, that I'm sure has a thriving <laughs> academic environment. I'm sure they have a university. Right. They used to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but um, yeah, so also when it's often uh, people say when they write a proof with like a similar. Um, Similar structure. structure, they would quote some other proof. They say this proof uh, follows oh, the structure yeah. of um, yeah. blah, blah, blah. So, usually, mathematicians are not eager to like steal someone's ideas. It's not, people are mostly humble and mostly claim they haven't come up with anything. It's all old, like by other people, and they start a talk saying they didn't do anything new. Yeah. Um, okay, so the maybe, so it's okay, we have just two prepared questions left so let's let people go soon because it's been a lot of time but say so how do you get collaborators so 
Yeah, so we actually said many things already that I wanted to say as an answer to this question. You should uh, go to many conferences, you should go to many talks, you should most of all chat with people. And a lot of collaborations are born of informal chats. And uh, sometimes you discover, and sometimes, for example, a, a thing that happened to me a couple of times is that um, you would have, uh, you would chat with a person, a person asks a question and you say, oh yeah, this is similar to this other thing. And then a paper is born uh, <laughs> after a while. Uh, so getting collaborators, actually, I think the main thing is to meet with many people. I mean, it's kind of a tautology, it's kind of an obvious thing, perhaps. If you don't meet with anyone, you will never find collaborators. Well, now people do it online, so online meeting counts as meeting. Online meeting counts as meeting, although it's, it's harder, but it did happen to me. It's not, it's not impossible. Yeah. Um, uh, in fact, I think I met in person with like half of my collaborators at this point, <laughs> numerically. <laughs> perhaps I should count, but okay. Uh, this was also the pandemic that didn't help. Uh, yeah. uh, but uh, yeah, you the, the find collaborators as obvious as it is, but I think I insisted on in this question because I think it's something that needs to be said. It's something that was not said to me. Uh, and I guess it was counted as obvious, but it took me a while to learn it, to get collaborations, to get really to do math. You should meet with as many people as you can. Uh, oh, I'm sorry you didn't know. Well, I mean, now I don't. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and I, I really want to insist because it seems obvious, but. I'm, some people don't know it, and I really want to say it. Uh. Um, yeah, so I would add that um, it's actually something that really, really gets easier with time because I think in the beginning, like getting a first collaboration may look like scary. How do you how do you start? But I would say the first time is an accident, and then you, like by inertia, the people with whom you have already done something usually you not. Always, but often you keep discussing some stuff with them, and so once some people are collaborators, unless it was a terrible experience, usually later you keep discussing, thinking, doing something. So this amount like grows x linearly. I mean, I don't know that. It's your <laughs> metaphor. No, for, gonna... for you, it's explanation. For me, it's kind of explanation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, don't be afraid that you. I mean, if you want to work with other people, and you better do because it's much more fun and easier. Um, don't be afraid that you won't be able to find them. It's only hard in the beginning. Um, and usually people start because they may have like ideas about a common problem. And so some some younger PhD student asked me like, oh, I like this person. Can I collaborate with them because I like them? Well, I think in practice, usually you start because of a common research interest, like a common question or problem or common ideas. And then you become friends during a collaboration. Um, uh huh. And um, yeah, so um, it's so, although like in dreams, it would be nice to just like work with my best friends, but usually you, you, it's the, it happens in the opposite direction. People become your close friends or enemies uh, during a collaboration, mostly close friends. Uh, uh, and that's a very, actually, that's a very cool experience as I, when you guys asked about us dating, no, we're not dating, but it is, it is really something closer than usual friendship because you talk so much, because you discuss so much, because you learn to, th you learn how the other person is thinking and you learn how to explain things so that they find it most natural. It is really cool. So um, I, I really appreciate my friendships with collaborators. Um, and I, th I would say that's one of the things I appreciate the most in math research is that you choose people with whom you work. That's really cool. Um, not not many jobs have this privilege. Oh, uh, one other thing actually that I want to say on this is um, some people sometimes ask me, oh, can I send an email to person X? Won't they be offended that I dare to write them? No, I mean, they might not answer you. And uh, I apologize to everyone that I haven't answered to. I try, but I, I have a huge backlog of emails. Sorry, I'm, I'm working through it uh, uh, because people are busy. Uh, people are busy and sometimes they don't have time. Uh, but it does help if you write the email in a very concrete fashion, like you have a precise question you want to ask this person. But usually people are happy to answer. The, the bottleneck is time.
Yeah, so yeah, sometimes people don't answer because they're busy or they don't know an answer. But everyone is happy, when, especially when you ask them. So of course, it's you don't ask a person who works in analysis questions on. Um, and you also should ask precise questions, not big questions. Question. Like, yeah, so try to ask precise questions, uh, be, better short ones than long ones. And um, people are happy when you ask about their research. So it's like it's a question on their paper, they will most likely answer. Uh, because they're pleased because they put much more effort into writing that paper than questions they received afterwards, usually. Um, and But if you write like a long question, which is technical, uh, as Ravi said, Ravi Vakil said in his interview, technical questions must be motivated. Like, why do you care? Because this is a technical, like, I need to prove this technical lemma. And then Ravi doesn't know why do you care. So he won't probably invest time into proving the technical lemma for you. Um, so yeah, but like writing emails is a good practice and it's good for you to formulate a question. It is uh, because while writing, you will you will understand more. Um, okay, so, um, oh, by the way, yeah, so the Journal for Long Articles is asterisk, I think. Uh, there are, I mean, actually we didn't submit any of these to asterisk. Okay, but you could. I mean, the point is that, yeah, the, the asterisk, sure. Uh, oh, I think okay. also uh, the um, publication de la IHS. Nah, for no. top papers. Okay. Yeah, the, but yeah. I, I guess it depends on. Yeah. But uh, uh, I mean, I'm just going to say that the, the, those three papers that are out already, we submitted them and they didn't get desk rejected. So journals clearly at least consider those papers. <laughs> Whether they will be accepted or not, uh, well, we'll see. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Um, Let's discuss the last uh, important subject, and then if, if there are more questions, we can address them. But the last important thing, which no one asks about, and I wish you did, so that's a question from me to me and to Dennis, and this is super important, how to give math talks. <laughs> Some very important skills. So I'm going to steal a tip from Mike Hopkins that told me when I was a PhD student, and uh, I think it's a very important tip, and I want to repeat it. When you give a talk, you should tell a story. It's not important that you give all the details. It's important that there is a story. So there is an, you know, a, a beginning where you motivate and you introduce people to your story. Then there is the meet where you tell all the stories and that there should be a conclusion. It's like you really should craft a narrative. Otherwise, people won't follow. People are not able to follow like someone throwing at you random facts <laughs> that you have to catch with your head. And, and, but that doesn't work. You have to craft a narrative, something for people to follow. Um, uh, and that's actually, I think, the main important thing. The other thing is don't spend too much time on the details. It's fine if you give some of the important details at the end. Um, that's reasonable, uh, especially since at the end, a lot of people will have stopped listening. Um, that, that's OK. That's fine. You shouldn't feel upset about it. Um, you shouldn't. But in the beginning... In the beginning, they should at least try to... But that, that's also important while you, you, you tell, should tell your story with an approachable beginning. You should try to sell. You should... Like, when you write a story, you shouldn't start in medias res, uh, so to speak. In, in, what? in the middle of the thing. I mean, this is narrative technique where you start without any context to entice the reader. This doesn't work for much research. He was so. looking at her dead body. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I, I think you know that about this in research. Well, okay, some of them. But <laughs> okay, uh, so um, so if you can put some technical, some important technical details at the end. Actually, there is this format of talks that I really like that we used to do when I was in Paris, which was a talk divided in two parts with a coffee break in the middle, so that people that are not interested in the details could leave during the coffee break. I would leave all them. <laughs> I, sometimes I left, sometimes I didn't, but it, it was it was actually very good, I think. Yeah. Um, but. You should give them something to bring home. So you should give them a conclusion. You should give something understandable. In the technical details, I mean, that's why you write the paper, why you put all the effort we discussed to write the papers with all the details. People won't be able to follow your details during the talk. And OK, that was, um, oh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, also don't be upset if people leave at the end. I mean, if people don't listen at the end, people, I don't know, start reading something else or whatever at the end. That's normal. I mean. My human mind can only keep concentration so far, and only few people will be so interested to put like the extra effort to put to pay attention for one whole hour because that's a lot of effort, and you really need to, to care a lot about that too. Don't, don't be mad if most of the people 
don't put this kind of effort. To be fair, I mean, it's, it's unreasonable to ask of them to put this much effort. And the last thing, and that's actually an answer to you too as well, if when people ask questions and you don't know the answer, that's fine. Don't worry. Just say what you know of relevant, and if it's not an answer, it's not an answer. You can say if you don't know. Yeah, actually, that's a good thing. Many people are afraid of not answering questions during talks, and it's totally okay to say, I don't know, I will think about it, I will write you an email if I know it or, later. Or we can chat it later if you're in person. Yeah, but like even sending an email if you didn't yeah. know right away is okay because it's very hard to think at the blackboard. Yeah. Um, cool, these are good advice. I think I'd like to emphasize that why it's so important because giving talks is marketing. Marketing is an underrated part of doing research because I have this idea that like in research, this each person is a developer, a manager, a mark. Like you, you take part of all the things as like which in, in industry are divided between different people. So marketing of your research is your responsibility, and it is extremely important because unless you're a genius, people will not um, like d dig into understanding details of your work unless you advertise it to them. And um, so, and I think you, what you didn't say when preparing a talk, it's super important to think in advance who you're going to talk to. So you don't just give the same talk to different audiences. No, you must think each time in advance who you are speaking to, evaluate more or less the background of your audience, and then, important step, divide this by two. <laughs> <laughs> because most people tend to, um, to uh, uh, overestimate how much other people know. Usually, Although people look very smart, they know less math than they than you think they know. And because you've been working on your problem for like a year, you you imagine that the world is like focused on your problem. So you must like when preparing a talk, you basically zoom out a lot. Like you press this minus button on the PDF of your paper, and then you start like with the big picture, and then you like slowly zoom in and not 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 two hundred percent to like twenty percent. So. Um, and a lot also, yeah, I can say a lot of things that you think are trivial are trivial because you spent like six months thinking only about them. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I heard many people, so there was like a question about whether it's okay to criticize talks. I think it's not okay to criticize unless people want to hear criticism. So with, with any criticism, you better make sure that the person wants it. Unwanted criticism is not, uh, I, it's not I, a good I way to make I sent a friends. couple of emails occasionally, but there were special cases. But, uh, but, 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 I lost the thought. What did you say? We were talking about zooming out or criticism. Mm, yeah. Oh, yeah. So people often complain about talks uh, after the talk is given, but not to the speaker, between themselves. People often complain and very seldomly have I heard complaints like, oh, this talk was too easy to follow. <laughs> this talk was too. Oh, this talk was too short. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I would like to have stayed there two more hours listening to all these yeah. details. So please don't be don't, like do really try to be kind to the audience by by saying more general things, giving more motivation, giving less details until the in the end of the talk you can give the details. But please not in the beginning. In the beginning, people still have a hope to follow. And I, I should say, as a rule, I mean, all these rules can be broken, but please. Think very hard about breaking, not, not put more than one proof per talk. Yeah, proof there should be zero or one proof. Z zero is fine. Yeah. Zero is fine. More than one is like people will be lost. Uh, and um, so this is a little thing, but it makes me personally annoyed at talks. So some people do this, maybe, okay, they find it charming. I don't know. Uh, many mathematicians have this habit of like not taking a watch on the talk and then during the talk, asking five times, how much time do I have left? And when did I start? And then saying 10 times during the talk, oh, too bad I have little time left. I mean, people spend really uh, a lot of time on talking about the time in the talk. Well, I think you should you know, buy a watch, put it on your arm and we'll look at it and notice when you start the talk, know how long it should be and never, ever, ever go over time. Because all that people want in the end of your talk is to check their Instagram, have lunch and go to the bathroom. And no one wants to stay there longer unless they're really into it and then they will talk with you after the talk. So this is extremely important not going no, over time. Going over time is very bad manners. I mean, it's, it's a sure way of getting people to dislike you. Uh, um, can I answer? There was a question for me. Can I answer? Oh, yeah, sure. Of course, you can. <laughs> I mean, it's your channel. 
There was a question about the experience of being a woman. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, I should. I should. Um, that's a that's a big t subject. Of course, I cannot answer just like with yes or no. But uh, I was thinking about it. That my my experience is pretty good. Um, so on average, so I sh I feel I feel like I heard many women complaining more than I would complain. So maybe I should not speak for all women, but for myself, it's a much bigger trouble. Being a woman in math is a much bigger trouble for me outside math. So the fact that most people that I meet and tell that I'm a mathematician, their reaction is like, but you're a woman. It's not a female thing to do. Are you going to be a school teacher? You're still studying? No, I'm working. What do you mean working? You're going to be a school teacher. So like, and so this, so it's like people who are not mathematicians, people who are not mathematicians, give me tons of comments of how what I do, I cannot do because of my gender, how I will not be able to be a mathematician, how this is not a female, blah, 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 blah. And especially I got like, during my, I, I am still confused how did I manage to go to study math because during my high school, everyone except my family would tell me this. And even my math teachers would suggest me not to go to the math faculty because uh, because it's not, not for girls. And um I'm still shocked that I went there. I guess I'm just stubborn and I also didn't know what else to do with my life. Um, We're all very thankful that you made it. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, seriously, she's, a, she's an amazing person. It's, it's great to have her in our community. Oh, yeah. so mostly my, this is my mostly experience in academia. And uh, yeah, that was Russia. Um, and um, so yeah, in, within academia, my experience is mostly totally fine. I don't like I'm surrounded only by men. I work only with men, and I don't notice it. I don't feel it uh, unless like unless uh, okay, there are very seldom occasions where I do realize that people perceive me differently. But usually, it's people outside who tell me um, who tell me something. And and another thing is affirmative action, which is originated as like. That's an you know an approach to solving problems like problems are real about underrepresented minorities and stuff. The approach of affirmative action sometimes takes like inadequate forms and makes minorities even more insecure and unsure of themselves. And this is a big problem, I think. And because imposter syndrome is known to be high, even it's very high among all um, people in academia. It's you know, like in math at least, it's known to be even higher at, at people in minorities and then affirmative action makes it worse. And for, I mean, it does good stuff and makes this problem worse because people believe even less in themselves. I certainly struggle with that. And poor Dennis has to have listened to hours and hours and hours and hours of me whining about how I'm terrible at everything. And I promise not to talk psychology here, but yeah, okay, that's, that's a problem. <laughs> um, Okay, yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, let's. So these are. <laughs> Women questions. What? That's a joke. <laughs> um. Uh, okay. So I I said all all that I'm prepared to say. Let me look through your questions in the last ten minutes and see. Um. Let me see. Okay. Cool. 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 Cool whether we share our ideas or conjectures quickly or wait and try whether we can solve ourselves. So I, don't, I think it's personal for everyone, but usually people don't have too much patience to wait for long. So uh, you can think about something for a couple of days, but then you're tempted to talk about it to someone, right? Yeah, I mean, I know only one person that tries to keep things for themselves. I won't name names, of course. Because it's a secret person. <laughs> no, I mean, because I don't like to do to, to. But okay. most people actually talk very quickly, me included. Yeah. yeah. I mean, a couple of days, it was a big exaggeration. So for me, it's like a couple of minutes, but I imagine that for others, it's a couple of days. Um, okay, uh, cool, 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 cool. Whether we talk to physicists, well, some mathematicians do. I mean, sometimes, I think collaborations hardly ever, but I mean, Witten- Yeah, that happens. I mean, there was this, um, um, this thing between Hopkins and Freed. I think recently, where they did some state of matter things using topological K theory. I'm not sure I okay. I, I remember this. Um, but that happens. I mean, it, in, in our okay. era, it's not super common, but it is something. There, there is a psychology question. Okay, I, as you can get. <laughs> okay, so how not to get intimidated or annoyed by, by the vast amount of technical details? 
how to battle the fear of not knowing enough details to do something meaningful. So yeah, I can answer this. I've struggled with this for many years. And recently I just came to conclusion that there, so the, the general problem with like, I think this, the psychology of doing math is that you always, well, not maybe not always, I always imagine that there is like this amount of math I should know and this is, this is the amount of math I know. And so uh, it's always a feeling that like you should know more, you should do more and stuff. So since recently, I imagine that there is an infinity of math that one could know and could do. And so no matter how much you do, you never reach infinity. And so um, you should concentrate on how much you actually do manage to do on your progress, like from zero to epsilon, because Comparing to infinity does not make sense. There will always, like, you, one thing I can promise you, if you pursue your career as a mathematician, do math until the end of your life, you will die not knowing and not having done enough math as, like, as much as you'd like. So um, this is something to accept. So just, I think it, for me, it's easier to think about infinity. And even when I open a hard research paper or, like, I'm in a difficult talk, I even then, like, even just with one, just one talk and one paper, I imagine that there is an infinite material, which is, touched in that like based on you know like this whole big this like it's just on top of the iceberg this paper talk which is like the iceberg is infinite anyway so then this relieves the pressure i cannot possibly understand everything i just try to do what i can and then do a little more <laughs> okay um nice math talk to watch on youtube i think mike mike hopkins talks are very fun to watch yeah, but you shouldn't use him as a model of rigor. Yeah, actually. just in, just enjoy. <laughs> They're very fun. He he gives he very good talks. Okay. Um, I also should say that you should watch Mura's talks. Mura gives good, great talks. Aww. There are a lot of them. Oh. Um. Uh, okay. Um. If what's a good way to see if you're doing completing undergrad, whether to do a PhD. I think you should, first of all, you should be willing to do a PhD. That's important. And not just for getting, okay, the bad reason to do a PhD is to get a PhD title. If that's your main motivation, that's a waste of four years, I think. So better not do that. But if you're really, if you feel interested in math, if you feel curious, I think it's a, you don't lose much by trying because you can leave PhD. No one is going to so put you just to be clear, a PhD is in part a painful experience, not exclusively. Mm -hmm. But it, there, there is some struggle in a PhD. Even people that seem to breeze through, believe me, they, they, they have it. And uh, so, yeah, you, you really have to want to do it uh, to, to, to get to the end. So uh, besides that, I mean, if you have an undergraduate advisor that knows your situation better, it's usually good to talk with them. But they never discourage to do a PhD unless they're better. Mm, I mean, it depends, but OK. But still. Yeah, that's okay. You really, I mean, you, you're really paying in terms of suffering and effort, and you will get a lower wage than doing equivalent things. Or if money is important for you, then yeah, maybe not if you go to Switzerland. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> actually, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, um, so so there are costs. So it is something you need to be passionate about. Which I don't want to discourage you. I mean, I, I did it. It's it's great and everything. But I think I had a different experience. So. They, there was they, speaking of women in math. My experience studying in Russia was such that PhD in Germany was such a relief <laughs> that it did not feel like pain at all. And I mean, um, so um, yeah. But I think it's important to remember. So people, some okay, many people go into PhD. Some people are don't enjoy it and find it just painful. And then I think it's totally okay to quit. And people find it very hard to quit because they they're afraid that they are like they'll be like failures or this it's a failure to quit. I think it's a waste of time to keep doing something for years that you which is just pain for you with no joy. So keeping in mind, like go into PhD if you're unsure with the idea that if it goes badly for you, it's okay to quit and you will not be a failure. You will not like blame yourself for doing this. And then it's an easier decision. You just like you're curious, you want to try, you don't have to keep doing it and then it's like it's it feels lighter when you don't put so much pressure on you and um yeah you'll learn things you'll meet people uh and then you'll see if it's there was a question about whether it's reasonable to first go to industry and then go back to a phd that's more common in like engineering or stuff there i know a couple of people that did that in math but it's very uncommon 
Um, no, I mean maybe it's maybe it's an okay thing. To, actually, wait. I, mean, I don't I, want to say it's it's wrong to do it, but most people I know that went with that plan never went back for the PhD. Uh, yeah, so. you get used to certain lifestyles. You get a yacht. You have a tennis <laughs> course in your backyard. Um, <laughs> no, but like I have, I know so among my PhD siblings, few people first uh, after completing masters, they did some teaching at universities. And then went into PhD. Yeah, but that, that okay, yeah. So that ideas. is that happens. Actually, my, my PhD brother, I think, taught history or like something oh, like that. Wow. And then mm -hmm. went. So okay, this happens. It's unusual. I think it's cool. No, I think making an internship in industry is nice. But maybe don't. Yeah, like you, you. It's hard to get back. And then many people remain with. I know, like nowadays, I have few friends in industry who have this like unfinished dream of getting a PhD. So, you know, it's it's complicated. People are always hesitating about the opportunities they didn't take. Yeah, That's it, human. Yeah, it, it is definitely more common in applied fields. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, no, it's not OK to, for a professor to date students. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's not OK. Um, Where was the question? Here. I mean. Undergrad students, I think, should not be your target. And then later, make sure that you are completely stay away from their career. It's totally not OK for a person, like a dependent relationship where one person t has any effect on the career of the other person is not a cool thing. That's like a bad thing. Yeah, no, that, that's... So you can, but like if you can guarantee that you will have no effect, like no direct effect on their career. Like you should not be writing recommendation letters for them. You should not take hiring decisions for them and so on if you're a more senior. Um, and there are a couple of cases where a PhD student married their advisor. Yeah, and, and many abusive relationship cases. Yeah, and I, I, wasn't, I didn't want to say that it was a good thing, uh, yeah. but I, I, I okay. wouldn't recommend it. I think it. we should, so, uh, Thanks. Yeah. See, I, I get support. Yeah. So I can tell you that's usually like a male professor and a female student. And um, on the female side, I can tell you that's not OK. Uh, so um, OK, we will not do, do like dating advising here. I think we should actually. <laughs> uh, I really should not, not give dating <laughs> advice to anyone. Just, but like, OK, main advice is make sure to not affect in any way the career of a your partner if, they, if you have a common field or something um, okay so i think it's been two hours i think yeah, we should actually we should finish you could send us more email send us emails if you have more questions um maybe one last question oh come on oh no let's just receive thank yous and 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 enjoy. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah um okay i hope i hope something of that was useful and uh, feel free to email us. Unlike Dennis, I actually try to answer all emails. I, I also <laughs> try. I'm just failing. <laughs> OK. I procrastinate by answering emails. <laughs> mm. uh, thank you very much for having me here. It was oh, a pleasure. you're welcome. <laughs> we are at Dennis' place, so yeah. Um. <laughs> well, you. your, your channel, come on. you know. OK. Um, OK. So. Okay, I think we, we should go. It was great to have you all. You, you asked lots of good questions. Sorry that we couldn't cover all of them. Um, and if you have ideas for next live session, you can write me because I have no idea for next live stream. So um, especially if you hope to see it more often, well, I need more ideas. I don't, I don't want to do the same live stream again. I think we should choose some other aspects. Maybe I would be happy to talk about psychology, psychological problems of doing well that I can do forever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, thank you, Dania, for staying with us for whole two hours. Um, okay. Bye. See you. see you. Yeah, I hope we'll try to save it. Okay. Uh, take care, all of you. Don't get discouraged. Have fun. Enjoy studying math. And, and no Perelman interview is coming because he stopped uh, communicating with colleagues. And um, unfortunately, that's a sad story different subject but you please all take care uh, don't work too hard uh, enjoy life and enjoy math and yeah ask more questions bye, bye.